quality and like it doesn't really look like you all that much and so i'm like okay like i'll get you a new headshot and i just i can't stand the way i look like i hate it um but you know that's life <laughs> quarantine i don't think has done i know we're live ca i'm just chit chatting <laughs> CA's like oh my god you're live and you're just talking about whatever um <laughs> yeah uh so Hey guys, it's me, Dan. I'm just here talking about whatever with Andrew. Uh, we're gonna get started talking about uh, Substrate Archive here in a few minutes. What's up, Joshi? Um, as usual, you know, probably we'll wait until like 7.03 to like get into the deep stuff, Andrew. That's when you can like share your screen and really kick things off. Uh, but I usually like to give okay. people just a few minutes to kind of, to kind of. Uh, yeah, for sure. Hello, hold everyone. On. I really like that. Uh, that poster you have back there of Berlin. Oh, thanks. Yeah. I got, it, it, I got it for the for the screen for the photo the videos. So for the background? Like the middle. Yeah. Yeah. Nice. Nice. I need to to do something like that. As you can see, I just have like a bare guest room. Yeah. <laughs> it's all right. <laughs> so Andrew, how long have you been at Parody? Uh well I probably about a year since I was full time. So actually, yeah, almost exactly a year. I joined full time last August. So around the last oh. Web3, so. Nice, nice. Happy, uh, happy parodiversary. Oh, thanks. <laughs> <laughs> I was, that's like the other thing about quarantine is today I was like, man, I've already been working at parody for like a while. The, the time just goes so fast when all you do is sit at home all day. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Andrew, uh, someone's asking what games you like to play. I also noticed your oh. uh, your controller back there. Yeah, I mean, I've been playing a lot of Valorant recently. Um, I, I'm into like shooter FPS games. Play with the team and stuff. So I play with some some people I know. It's good to pass the time, especially in uh, quarantine. So yeah, nice. All right. Well, we're we're about three past Andrew. So um, yeah, I, I think everyone that's here should be, you know, more or less familiar with the format. This is Substrate Seminar, as I'm sure you can already probably tell, this is a very casual conversation where we learn about the technologies of Substrate and Polkadot and all that kind of stuff. And so today we have Andrew joining us and he's going to talk about a project that I personally think is really, really cool. And I'm very excited to learn more about and that's Substrate Archive. So with that, Andrew, it's, Great. it's all you. Thanks. Let me just share my screen real quick. Hopefully everything uh, works out. While Andrew does that, guys, just remember that we have the ask a question box. If you have like, you know, questions about the materials that Andrew is talking about, uh, we'll also, of course, have like some question and answer afterwards. Um, and as always, I'll be kind of monitoring the chat box uh, for whatever chit chat may be going on in there. But serious questions, please use the ask a question. Uh, all right, I'm gonna mute myself, Andrew. Okay, great. Can can everyone see my screen? Is my screen okay? Yep, it yeah, looks perfect. Great. Okay, cool. Yep. Um, yeah. So first, I mean, I'll, I guess I'll just explain what Substrate Archive uh, actually is. Um, so, at its core level, Substrate Archive is an indexer just for all the data that's in Substrate stored in the backend um, RocksDB. Uh, RocksDB is basically just a key value store of data. So it's kind of, if you're into programming, it's kind of like a hash map. You just have a key that can be anything like, uh, for example, an account, and then that'll be attached to, um, you know, the balance in that account, for instance. Uh, there, there's no relations between the data. It's just all kind of stacked up in one uh, database. Um, and so the purpose of Substrate Archive is to take all that data uh, and kind of just stuff it into a relational database like Postgres that is able to, um, that where you're able to define relations between different tidbits of data. So for instance, you can define a relation between an account and um, the nominators it's uh, nominated, uh, sorry, the validators it's nominated. Uh, and that lets you quickly look up uh, like different data for uh, specific instances. Uh, yeah, different data for anything you want. Um, which isn't normally possible through RPC because, uh, and the RPC is basically just a raw interface to this uh, substrate client, which interfaces with RocksDB. And so when you query for something through the RPC, it's 
the only way it can get this data is through a linear search through um, the RocksDB database, which turns out to be extremely slow when you have like hundreds of millions of storage entries and stuff. Uh, whereas with archive, you can just say, uh, you know, this little piece of data is uh, attached to this, and then it'll just have everything already set for you. Um, so that's the idea, I think. Uh, and I'll just start. Andrew, I'll just can, I just kinda, yeah. can I just kind of dig into that concept a little bit more? Yeah. Um, <clears throat> so uh, one of the things we've talked about a lot on seminars, like palette development and everything, and we've talked about, you know, storage items that, that you define in a palette. And so, you know, for most of the substrate based chains that you're interacting with, a lot of the stuff kind of just boils down to like what what kind of storage items do these pallets maintain and that that basically defines what you're able to query and so one thing that i often do when when people come into substrate technical and say hey is there an rpc endpoint that i can use to get this information is i think okay well first of all what pallet would that information be in and then i just kind of go look and i see like is that data stored by this pallet and if it's not stored in the database by that palette, then the answer is pretty much probably no. You can't really make an RPC query to just get that data. You can run these super powerful tools like Archive that you're about to tell us all about that can index events and errors and you know all kinds of things that come off of these uh <clears throat> blockchain clients and then use the power of a relational database to to perform all these kinds of queries that allow you to to get the answers that you're looking for yeah, but exactly yeah but when when you're talking about in general palette development or runtime development a lot of what you're often looking to do is minimize what you what you keep in storage and so what that often means is that it, it also limits the, the kind of capabilities that you have for querying these types of things. And so that's why we have these really powerful tools like Archive that do what they're supposed to do really well and expose a host of capabilities. So for sure, that's, yeah. That's my little soapbox on relational databases. Yeah. I love them. <laughs> Great, yeah, yeah, no, you're exactly right. That's. Um... Yeah, that's definitely the purpose of uh, Substrate Archive. Uh, and I'll, I'm just going to start off by running um, the latest master to show you what just the core data format looks like. Uh, and I'll be running it on West End, I think. So we should start up West End. Um, and obviously, you want to run this in pruning and archive so that none of the data that Substrate Archive wants to index is deleted before it's indexed. Uh, and let's make sure that runs. Uh, I have this compiled. I'm just going to make sure I'm the, on the right branch here. Yes. Yeah, we'll check out master. Uh, actually, I forgot I created a demo folder here, so so Andrew, it looks like you just uh, started up a polka dot node. Oh, on the West End chain, which yes. I like. That's our, our test net. So that's a good chain to use when you're testing things. Don't test in production. Um, and, and so you're just running it in archive mode, which means that it is going to store uh, the whole history of the chain. It's not going to prune any blocks over time. Right. Yeah. 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 And you want that. Um, yeah. Yeah. Can you increase the font size, please? Oh yeah, yes. sure. Thank you a lot. Sorry, I should have asked that before. Okay. My bad, guys. It's okay. Bad host. <laughs> this better? Uh, no, Increase it's gonna. It I would say three, two to three more probably. Okay, I'll just uh, I'll move this into another tab then. I think, probably uh, even I even one more would be good. More. I know it's not the best experience. Okay, that that's that's great. Thank okay. you, Andrew. 
OK, cool. Um, yeah, so I'm just going to start it here. Uh, it's just Polkadot Archive. There's a configuration file. So Polkadot Archive is just using the Substrate Archive library. So I made a configuration file that um, I kind of echoed above, catted, whatever. Uh, and it just defines like the database and other configuration variables. Um, I'm going to just run that. OK, one more thing, Andrew. I'm sorry. Yeah. I like uh, the place that our videos are, it's like right on top of what you're doing. And I don't know how to move the videos around. So it, sure. if you could just kind of like scooch things over a little bit so the videos don't block uh, it. Okay. Sorry. Is it uh, th for, uh, to the right side or? That looks a lot. Yeah. Yeah. That's much, much better. Okay. Yep. Thank you. Thank cool. you for pointing that out, Sam. <laughs> Apologies. Um, yeah. So. It just started indexing stuff. Um, first thing it does is just load all the blocks. So we've loaded, I don't know how up to date my West End is here. Um, or 233. So just I think take, it's... taking a step back, because there was a little bit of confusion sure. that just went on there. We have two terminal windows running, oh. each one running a separate application. One of them is running this node that we talked about, a West End node in archive mode. And the other one is running Substrate Archive, what we're here to talk about. And so you're going to tell us what, what's going on in this terminal window right here yeah. that's running Sub Substrate Archive. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, I'm running Substrate Archive uh, in this window. We don't have to worry about the West End node. We can just, we're just connected to a node. Um, and so I'm already synced a little bit, but when it starts syncing, it just it'll just collect all the blocks. So we were twenty five thousand blocks behind our West End node. Um, so it collected all those, and then it'll insert them. It'll get the metadata for the runtime version of those blocks. Um, and then once those are inserted, what will happen is uh, Substrate Archive will recognize that it needs to also index the storage. So what happens is uh, it begins to execute each block. Um, that we've already gathered. Uh, so that's what this indexing storage is. And this is the storage ind indexing is the most time consuming part of the indexing because we have to re execute each block in order to get every single storage change in that block. Um, this lets us avoid actually querying the RPC and querying through the client. So it's still faster than that, but uh, we do have to still execute them. Um, and that's basically it. And so this has all been archiving up here to a Postgres database um, called West End Archive. Uh, so I can go down, I think uh, it's open data grip. That's what I use to see the data and stuff. Okay, Andrew, while you do that, I'm gonna I'm gonna go ahead and start asking some questions that have been coming in. Um, it seems like a lot of people are curious about um, exactly archive. What, what that does. And so let, let's tr sure. see if we can take this. Um, I think there's like three of them. So let's see if we can take them in the most logical order. Um, can Addy wants to know, can you speak to what uh, pruning archive does to the node? Does it maintain all blocks indefinitely? Uh, yes, yeah. So when you set your node to pruning archive, uh, it not only will maintain all the blocks that you have synced um, up to the latest. It'll also maintain all the storage that it's collected from those blocks in the RocksDB database. Uh, awesome. Okay, so let's these all these questions kind of relate to one another. So sure. now uh, Joshi wants to know. Um, so in archive mode, does it keep all the blocks, or does uh, does it like get rid of the blocks that are from like old forks or whatever? Let me read it exactly how Joshi read it. Pruning archive means the node will keep all the blocks around forever. Does it also keep old fork blocks that will never be the main chain? Uh, I'm pretty sure that uh, pruning archive will. I'm, I'm I'm honestly not sure on this one, but my um, hunch is that pruning archive keeps only the canonical blocks. So and any block that has been finalized will be um, in printing archive. Um, but I'm not totally sure. I, I, I mean, uh, Substrate Archive will only index finalized blocks. So at least the way it's done right now. Um, I haven't really looked into collecting blocks from forks. So. Yep. Yeah. That My guess would be the same as yours. So the short answer is we don't know. 
Andrew has a clear answer on what Substrate Archive does, which is awesome. But um, we'll, we'd have to get back to you on that one, Joshi. Kian says 99% sure it won't keep forks around. So that, that sounds reasonable. Okay, there's still a few more questions. So um, David is wondering, um, can Substrate Archive, uh, can Substrate Archive work when the node isn't running in archive mode or like can archive work when it's with default pruning? Uh, I, it won't work, I'm pretty sure. Um, <laughs> I haven't really tried it recently. Uh, you can run archive without running a node as long as you've run the node with pruning archive in the past. But if you try running it without pruning archive, Substrate Archive will probably just complain that there's missing blocks in the RocksDB database. Yep. Um, Undefined behavior, right? We It's designed to run against an archive node. Yes. Um, OK, let's see if there's some other. OK, I, this is a really, really good one. Um, does Substrate Archive work with both Parity DB and RocksDB, uh, or only one or the other? Uh, so far, we are only supporting RocksDB. Um, Parity DB support is planned, though. Yeah. Can you um, can you actually sure. give just a little um, rundown on kind of the differences? I have a very abstract understanding, but you may have a, a little bit less uh, abstract. Yeah, I mean, so I I haven't dealt much yet with Parity DB because it's I haven't implemented it in Substrate Archive. But as far as I understand, uh, Parity DB doesn't uh, keep a cache like RocksDB does. So when you um, get a key in RocksDB, it'll go through like um, a data structure cache and um, and all these other structures that are optimized for use cases. Like, uh, I don't know, Facebook uses RocksDB to store all their data. So it's optimized for that use case. But in blockchains, this cache kind of serves, can be an impediment when you're trying to query lots of data. And so ParityDB kind of gets rid of unnecessary stuff um, and sticks to what's just needed for blockchains. Uh, that's how I understand it. Um, but I haven't really dug into it that much to give a really good answer on that one. Uh, sorry. Nice. So no, that's great. I mean, that that's more, more than I knew. So basically, um, as you kind of mentioned, like right now, we, we're building this storage database backend key value store. We're using this kind of community library, obviously very well respected community library, RocksDB, yeah. to, to yeah. do this. Um, and that's working for now. But we're also working on implementing a, a more performant solution that, that we're going to be able to kind of like replace out from underneath RocksDB at some point. Yeah. And yeah. yeah, so that that speaks to the the good design of Substrate and the cool stuff that we're doing here at um yeah, for sure. at Parity. Someone I'm 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 not sure if this is a joke or not, um, but one of the comments on the, the question about does archive work with Parity DB and RocksDB, does it work with Cassandra? I, I don't think it would. Um, Cassandra is like so, a, what is that, like yeah. some kind of MySQL or something? I think it's, uh, is it distributed? Or am I, maybe it I'm thinking of Kafka? I don't know. Um, but so Parity B DB and RocksDB are both the databases underneath the blockchain client. And Cassandra, I don't believe, is being evaluated as an option yeah. to replace either one of those. Substrate, yeah. oh, go ahead. I mean, the cool thing is that the way Substrate is coded, um, I think you could basically replace RocksDB and ParityDB with anything. I think there was a team that replaced it with Sled uh, I was looking into, which is a Rust key value store, um, because it's, it's all generic. So if you really want to run Substrate with Cassandra, you could probably just take the database library and figure it out. But um, I, I wouldn't say I would recommend it. And we're, we are not looking to do that on yeah, our end. Yeah. Sub, uh, Parity is not evaluating that. And then on the archive level, that's a relational database is what archive uses. So just m making yeah. sure that we're keeping those two things yes. separate. Um, yeah. Let's see, there's a few more questions in here. Um, wow, there's a lot of questions, Andrew. Um, okay. Do you <laughs> maybe want to open up the questions and see what looks uh, good on sure. your end? Are you able to sure. do that? Yeah. Just yeah. So, um, Okay. We can yeah, leave they're... some of them till the end. If any of them sure. feel right for you to answer now. 
Okay, so Substrate Archive is not communi communicating with the running node. It's directly reading the database. Um, yeah, so Substrate Archive um, actually uses a custom Substrate client that I designed, kind of refer to it as an archive client. And the purpose of that is to allow calls into the runtime for executing blocks. Um, and it can only read from RocksDB. So there's no... Um, there's no communicating over RPC uh, or any kind of network. It's all RocksDB or this archive client that can only read. It can't mutate anything, can only read and execute blocks and stuff like that. Um, That's really fascinating. So you're, you are not like reading events and, and then somehow constructing a database. You're really like hooking directly into the, the underlying database and kind of mirroring that in this, Postgres database? Yeah, yeah. So that uh, it gives a few advantages, chiefly that we don't have to, uh, you don't have to rely on the like network RPC or whatever. And you can take advantage of like sequential reads and on disks and stuff, which is uh, just orders of magnitude faster than like fetching each item from RPC. Absolutely. That, that's a great question and amazing answer. Super cool. Any of these other questions you want to tackle now? Uh, what's in the test conf? I'll explain that. Uh, later. <laughs> okay. Uh, how do you re-execute blocks? It's also okay. Yeah. Okay. All right. So I'm just going to go over the the standard data format. Um, are we answering one of these questions, or are you kind of back? Uh, your... Not yet. Yeah. I think okay. I'll, I'll okay. Get that's to them cool. Later yeah. No, that's perfect. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Just want to make sure I know. Yep. Okay. Going back on mute. Yeah. Uh, sure. Um, okay. Actually, this is wrong database. We're going West End. Okay. So the schema for just Substrate Master right now is very, very fairly simple. Um, you have just a blocks, metadata, and storage. I think, I don't know if I can pull up the schema in the repository right now. I think I had it right here, okay. So <clears throat> there's just three tables. Uh, you have the metadata, the encoded metadata. Um, and a lot of byte strings. So you have the runtime version that the metadata belongs to, the metadata, uh, the blocks. Uh, you have an ID with an index. Uh, you have a hash with an index, um, and all the other parts of the block here. Uh, and then you just have a storage table. Um, and so, can you increase the item... size on that a little oh, bit? Sorry, please. no worries. <laughs> uh, yeah. So and then you have a storage table which relates to blocks. So you from any storage entry, you can get which block that belongs to. Um, and yeah, that's basically it. Uh, and then what's interesting is, um, I don't know, right, yeah. So you, that's just like the master right now. And then um, in the future, there's gonna be type decoding, which will look more like uh, this which I have here, a little different schema. Andrew, can we, have, can we actually go back and look at that diagram one more time and just kind of yeah. deconstruct that a little bit? That, so this sure. is basically the, the entire schema of the archive database. As it is time. now, yeah. As yeah. it is now. So basically, we're, um, we're pretty familiar. Let me just, I'm going to share um, the doc that we have on metadata, which I was actually going through and reading our chat. I, I remembered that this is something that you and I worked on together, the docs for the metadata. Yeah. So this is like all the information about your runtime and everything. So there, that's stored as part of archive, you know, all the different pallets that are in the runtime, the, the calls yep. they expose, all these kinds of things. Then you have a table that stores each block that's created and finalized. It's only storing finalized yeah. blocks. These will only be canonical finalized blocks. Yeah, yeah. So that means that archive is not designed to run against chains that don't support finalization. Uh, I mean, it, I wouldn't say this. Uh, as long as they have blocks in the RocksDB database and the same format that is uh, substrate like Polkadot uses, then it would still work. How do you like it, how do you ensure that only finalized blocks make it into the archive database? What's the mechanism that that accomplishes uh, that? Yeah. Well, since uh, 
substrate will only store finalized blocks and pruning archive, then it's safe to just get the blocks table and get the blocks from there. So we don't um, like import blocks or anything. We only get them from like the blocks column and RocksDB, which only stores the finalized blocks. Okay, cool. And then the next one, can you talk a little bit about how you build up the storage table? Because um, I know that like one of the things that we're talking about is that's not fully implemented yet is state tracing, which is going to make this kind of stuff really easy. But how are you doing that now? What, yeah, I mean, sure. this looks yeah. really cool. Uh, I'm going to go back on mute. <laughs> yeah, so I created this diagram to kind of, it describes the whole how the data is processed and everything. Um, and so the uh, whole processing pipeline. So the, the pink represents a connection to this archive client. Uh, and the, all the gray lines are the data flowing through archive into Postgres. Um, and so. Going to have to ask you to increase yeah, the size again. Sorry. Uh, sorry. It's OK. Can, uh, can kind of go left to right here. Let's see if I can. Okay. That, look, that looks good. That's Thank good. you. Okay. Yep. Um, right. So you have the degree. So, all right. First, I should explain that uh, Substrate Archive is built upon this idea of an actor model, which is um, sort of a, a programming strategy where you have a bunch of independent uh, pieces that work together in order to uh, kind of come to one general conclusion. Um, which allows us to model the state machine in a very kind of um, in a way that is super understandable, I guess, because every single kind of bubble only handles one data type. Uh, and so if you wanted to add another data type um, for state tracing, for instance, uh, you could just add another, uh, I mean, in the code, you'd add another actor, but there'd just be like another bubble here. Um, but I'll explain what all this is. So um, the pink is, uh, Substrate client connections. Um, and then, uh, yeah, I explained that. So the first thing that happens is these blocks being collected from uh, the chain backend. So that will first check the database to see what blocks we already have. And then any blocks that we don't have, it will iterate all the blocks. Um, it will get all those blocks from RocksDB. And it gets the runtime versions from this runtime version cache, from which calls into Wasm for the runtime version for that block. Uh, and that, that's it's kind of like an optimization. But basically, you get the runtime version and some blocks, uh, which then get the metadata, which are then sent to the database. Uh, and then you have Postgres. Uh, this is also a, a diagram available in the wiki if you want to look at it uh, later. Um, and then once those blocks are in Postgres SQL, now the blocks, I'll just go back to this diagram. This is like the full block and substrate. So from this, uh, from just this data, minus the ID, because that's like an internal Postgres thing. Uh, you can actually rebuild the block with the generic uh, substrate runtime block type. Um, so once the blocks are in Postgres, we have sort of a task queue that listens for these block insertions. And then we'll uh, execute the blocks uh, via the substrate runtime. Um, and then that block execution function gives us all the storage changes for that single block. And these storage changes are just aggregated in order to it to be easier to actually insert insert into Postgres itself um, and faster because batch inserts are generally just faster than inserting uh, at once uh, one uh, one at a time um, and then gets into the database. I don't know if that answers the question um, a little bit, but I think the data flow might help. <laughs> yes, that's very helpful. Uh, thank you, Alan. Uh, thank you, Andrew. Yes. Sorry, I'm yeah. I'm doing other hosting things in the background here, but yes, that's a really really super helpful okay. um, diagram, and it's great also to see that you have such a well written wiki um, that that helps explain all of this stuff. Um, and yeah, yeah uh, do you mind if maybe we take another couple seconds to look at the questions? People are really sure. excited about this stuff. Um, so. If you remember any of the questions that you already saw that you think makes sense to answer, uh, please uh, attack those. And I'll, I'll let me look through here. Um, uh, Merck's, 
Go ahead. Go you go ahead. ahead. It's okay. Uh, Americ asked, extracting as much data as possible, how big does Postgres grow compared to RocksDB? Um, I think compared to RocksDB, I, I haven't checked how big RocksDB, oh, actually, so on latest Kusama, it's like 63 gigs RocksDB, and then um, I think it's like 100 gigs Substrate Archive. So it's like a 40 gig difference, um, which isn't too bad. I think, so yeah, I think that answers the question. <laughs> um, What's in test comp? How do you re-execute blocks? I guess I we can I can show how we re-execute blocks. Uh, I'll just see if there's any other questions. Can we? Okay, so with this storage cached uh, in, with this storage into Postgres DB, and we can just query them as normal SQL. Um, yes. Uh, yeah, so you can just query the normal SQL, so, but it's it's a yeah, yes yeah, query that. I mean, I'm not really sure if I. Oh shit! I just closed, locked myself out. Um, yeah, so it's just all in Postgres. So if you want to make a Postgres query, you would just. I mean, I can make one. I can show you. I'll show you some queries. Yeah, I can show some queries. I guess. Uh, So you, okay, you're logging. You're you're basically logged into the Postgres CLI client. So now you can make yes. queries against yeah. the Postgres database that we're we're filling up with all this information. Yes. Yeah. And yeah, I mean, I think yeah. This the short answer to this question is like a resounding yes. I mean, you could do all kinds of magic, you know, indexing. Um, that's something I'd love to hear about is what your indexing strategy is for this schema. Uh, oh yeah, it's actually pretty simple. Um, I'll just do a query and then I'll show the indexes. Mm -hmm. uh, so yeah, you can select count from blocks. Uh, so we have 120,000 blocks. I don't know if the, is archive still running. Archive still running. Uh, it's 121,000, 120,000, 121,000. It's about right, I think. Now there's 121,000. So. Uh, yeah, so I just showed that this is the running node. It's kind of all squished together, but we just finalized number 122.80. Uh, and so if we run a count from blocks, we get 122.938. So it's kind of um, there. Um, I don't know if you want to select um, from blocks where block num is equal to 66 and you just get all that data that's kind of all squished but um the id hash parent hash block them extrinsics root state root digest x uh, extrinsics uh and the uh, runtime version that, that this block belongs to and so this is what you said you were going to talk about is kind of like the what's coming next is decoding all uh, of that data and making it look a little nicer or well I can I can show so what's coming next is actually decoding um, everything. Mm -hmm. So if you saw on West End, everything is kind of encoded here. So this is West End, um, and everything's in hashes and and vectors of bytes. This is these are the extrinsics, mm -hmm. just one long vector of bytes. Um, but if we go to the extrinsics for Kusama, which is indexed up to block two million, I think mm -hmm. we just get um, all of the actual extrinsics. So we the signature is kind of scuffed now, so it's not actually the whole signature, just the name. If but, you could uh, increase the size of the screen a oh, little bit, that would be actually, helpful. I'm not sure how. <clears throat> but people, I'm, I'm not sure how closely you're following the troll box, but people were really loving your uh, your rad text editor, the the triple hex editor. Oh. People were giving you props nice. for it. Yeah. Um, I'm actually not sure how to increase the font size in a... Uh... Okay. It doesn't have to be like a if a huge deal if you're um, having yeah, a okay. hard time with it. I can't. So yeah. So because it's decoded, we can run cooler queries. Um, so I'll just bring this up because it's easier to see. Um, uh, where is this? Oh, so 
Oh, look at that. You're doing some JSON queries and everything. Yeah. Um, so we connect to Kusama DB, which has the decoded extrinsics. Uh, we can actually run a query that will get um, all the blocks, all, all, sorry. Yeah, all the extrinsics that have nominated towards this nominator. I think this address is, is not Kusama formatted. It's like Polkadot formatted, but we're querying on Kusama, but whatever. Um, yeah, so if we run this, uh, it might take a bit because I'm running a lot of other stuff at the same time. Josh, he was asking um, if if the way that you're doing things is similar to the way that PokéScan does things. I think specifically with respect to like connecting directly to the the database itself, as opposed to using RPC queries. Um, I'm not entirely sure. Yeah, yeah. So I think PokéScan just uses RPC to get all all its data um, and mm -hmm. they kind of maintain those nodes that gather the data for them. Um, so the main difference is that Substrate Archive is actually connected to like the raw database of uh, DocsDB. Cool, interesting question. Uh, yeah, so we just got all the extrinsics for um, this nominator, I think. Uh, yeah, it's kind of hard to, it might be, it's, it's all squished, but it's okay. <laughs> Uh, that's what that's what web UIs are for. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. So I mean, it's so, so so the decoded extrinsics are just stored as JSON, um, which allows us to store a variety of many different formats instead of having like hundreds of different columns for every possible value, uh, and we can just sort of query right into the JSON arguments of the extrinsic, um, specify that we want to get only extrinsics, um, which called the nominate uh, function. We can also specify the call module here. So if you really wanted to, we could say where call module equals staking and call name is nominate. Um, and then we specify that the ID must equal this. Um, and then that's it. Then you get can it. I just, I want to nerd out on that JSON query for a second. Cause sure. like, I think I've never actually used that in, in my real professional life, but I've heard about it. And like, I think it's so cool. So basically one of the cells here in, in your database, one of the values is it, its data type is JSON. So the, yeah. the table can hold, you know, numbers or strings or dates or currencies or whatever, but this data type is a JSON data type. And so now what you can do is, you can actually index within that cell because it itself is a structured piece of data. You can say, okay, I don't just want to get that whole JSON blob. I only want to get the args element of that JSON blob. And so it gives you like even finer grain querying capabilities. And so that's, that's a super neat thing. Yeah. For me. <laughs> yeah. It's a, uh... I think added in Postgres 9.3 is uh, like JSON B type, uh, which yep. allows you to actually query into JSON. Yeah. Yep. Um, very helpful for substrate. I don't have to worry about like catering to every single like data type. But I love JSON. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So um, that's sort of in an experimental branch. You can run it now uh, if you check out the type decoding branch in Substrate Archive. Uh, I have no promises that it will actually work well yet, but. Um, it works pretty well for Kusama, so um, hopefully in the near future it'll work better for all chains. Um, I don't remember. Uh, we're supposed to go on to block execution, I think. Yes, Kian had asked that question. Okay. Um, right. How so... do you re <clears throat> how do you re-execute the blocks? Do you rely on the underlying node, grab Wasm blob from the yeah. node storage, or something else? So this uh, this kind of brings us into how what Polkadot Archive and the test conf and every, everything actually is too. So, um... actually, Andrew, can I ask you to even kind of explain Kean's question? I I don't necessarily understand oh. it intuitively. Um, so okay. I could use a little explainer there. So um, basically, uh, our, our, I don't know. If, yeah. So once. 
a block basically just contains all of the data required to call a specific function in like a palette. So a palette will compile down to Wasm and all the, all the palettes compile down to one Wasm blob, which has um, functions for all the different stuff you put in your palettes. Um, and so when a block is created, the extrinsic section is just a list of uh, like a function call and then the arguments for that function. Um, and what happens is um, you feed that into the runtime in order to actually execute that function with those arguments and then get the results. And those results are your actual storage changes, uh, which Substrate Archive is indexing. Um, does that make sense? Yes, that makes a lot of sense. And as you're saying this, I'm actually like imagining like it's a very kind of simple, straightforward, elegant idea, really. And you can imagine it is almost like a digital version of like the punch cards that you may have heard about. Is uh, that yes. like we have this like blockchain runtime that's like this big, beefy machine that has all these capabilities for performing computations and whatnot. And then a block is basically like a big stack of cards that you stick into that machine and you say, OK, make these changes and it goes yeah. and it does those things but that that's kind of what we're doing right and so exactly a block right, actually, is just yeah. a big a big stack of these extrinsics <laughs> yeah yeah i mean that's a great analogy i didn't i never thought of it that way but yeah for sure uh yeah so um if we go into substrate archive uh look at archive and actually i think i created a little thing here in the demo. I mean, no, and so, so to kind of dig back into Keon's question, which I, I love, I'm looking, I'm looking forward to hearing the answer to this is he's basically saying like, okay, so with archive, you have these punch cards and, and now you want to derive the changes that those punch cards define. And so he's essentially asking, how do you, how do you do that? Yes. Is that correct? Uh, okay. Yeah, so like by default, this runtime, uh, the, the substrate runtime um, and all the macros that you kind of use in your substrate runtime generate uh, like a few key primitives that are used in substrate archive. Um, so the first is the runtime API um, and the executor. Uh, we see that I'm using no template here. I've imported it um, from just, you know, substrate. Uh, so we import the actual runtime of no template, uh, the block type of no template, and the executor. And the executor is what actually executes the block. Uh, and we just feed that as type arguments into Substrate Archive. Uh, and then that's also sort of the purpose of having Substrate Archive as a library instead of one sort of binary release is that it'll work for many chains since Substrate generates these for runtimes, then you just have to import them from the chain that you created. Um, and then I can actually show the block execution logic. It's very similar to how Substrate executes blocks. Um, well, first we'll show all the type arguments. Uh, we have a builder, um, and then we have the build. Yeah. <clears throat> so. What we just saw in the node template, I'll just actually go here. Uh, this block runtime, runtime API from archive builder um, <clears throat> is defined right here. So block runtime, and it's D here for dispatch, but uh, yeah, uh, executor kind of dispatches the stuff. So it makes sense. Um, and just all traits that are needed, which are fed into this build. And then from that, we're able to create our uh, client here, our new client backend runtime API client. So this is our connection to this archive client um, here. Um, <clears throat> I don't know what else uh, we can show. Runtime. So to kind of to kind of back up and understand, 
<clears throat> so archive is written in Rust, it looks like. Yes. Um, and so do you actually have an instance of the runtime as a dependency of archive? I can't imagine that's the case. Uh, yeah, so the runtime is a dependency. The latest runtime is a dependency of archive. And then any previous runtimes, um, the WASM, the client will fetch the WASM for those runtimes and execute that. And so if if the runtime, so that means that that these are tightly coupled and that when a new runtime version is deployed, you have to deploy a new version of archive that has the new runtime dependency? Uh, well, not necessarily. So it, it works the same as like a Polkadot node would work. So if you have a Polkadot node that's like 8.23 and then there's an upgrade um, to 8.24 and you're still on 8.23, uh, you switch from executing blah, like extrinsics in the native context uh, to executing extrinsics with the WASM. So the WASM blob, you'll get the WASM blob from like the network gossip or whatever, uh, and then you'll execute into that WASM blob instead of executing, um, you know, old. And blender. that's because the actual Rust dependency contains that executor logic. Is that correct? Yes. Yes. That yeah. Makes... We're not. Yeah. So okay. the logic for this isn't like reproduced or copied in archive. Uh, it's it's just kind of relying on that same logic that's already in Substrate. Exactly, uh, which is totally the smart thing to do. Okay, so just taking a, a couple steps back here. So what the question that we're trying to answer is, given that we have this stack of extrinsics, how do we turn that into the actual state changes? And the we're kind of drilling in on this answer that we basically need to, we need a machine to put these punch cards into. And so what you're saying is that just like when you compile the node template, one of the dependencies is the runtime. One of the dependencies of archive is the runtime against which you're running archive. And so that runtime dependency, the Rust code, contains this logic that says, OK, I have some natively compiled runtime that I have access to. But part of the thing that I'm doing is also tracking the value of the runtime in storage materialized as a WASM blob. And so if at any time I notice that this value, the WASM value, is newer than the native value, I'm going to use the WASM runtime. And yeah. so if a forkless runtime upgrade occurs, you just use that WASM. And so you're basically just getting all of this for free by just using a, basically a substrate dependency. Yeah, yeah. And so now let's say that I am launching my own chain, Amakala or whatever. Do I need to essentially fork archive and build a new version that has my runtime embedded as a dependency? Is that kind of the flow that you intend? Uh, no. So Substrate Archive itself is a library. So all the, the, this runtime um, here, if we go back to archive.rs. The runtime and uh, the executor are just type arguments. So they're generics uh, in the builder. So this builder is actually building the archive. And it just requires that your runtime implements some of the traits. Um, and a trait in Rust is kind of, you can think of it as um, like an interface in Java. Um, it just requires that your chain implements these traits. So that would be um, the, th these are also just generic traits in Substrate. So if you created your runtime with like the Substrate macros, then these should just be automatically generated for you. Um, and the traits are uh, Construct Runtime API, uh, like Block Builder API, uh, the metadata, uh, API extensions, uh, Native Execution Dispatch, uh, the State Backend, and that's pretty much it. Um, and there's all basically just you get that for free with Substrate as long as you're building your chain with Substrate and you know traditional way. Um, with so frame, the, basically, right? Yeah, Using the frame, frame macros. Yep. Yeah, the frame macros. Yeah. So yeah, so that's that's why there are like Polkadot archive and Node Template Archive and um, stuff like that. Is because those 
archives are just using the substrate archive library. I kind of refer to it as an engine because it's kind of you just define these two things and then say run and then it runs. It's less of like a library, I guess. I don't know. But um, yeah. That makes a lot of sense. Um, do you think, I feel pretty confident that we answered Keon's question. Is there anything okay. else that you want to add there or? Uh, no, I think, I think that's, that's good if it's, if it works out. Um, <laughs> yeah. What's in test conf? Uh, we can cover test conf. That's, uh, yes. Okay. So Joshi was asking, I guess, I didn't even notice this. So if you can back up and tell, tell us where this test conf file is, but I guess, uh, Joshi must have observed this when you were kind of navigating through your, uh, text editor and stuff. Yeah, so you have the like Polkadot archive library, and then you have um, like CLI binaries that actually use the library. And for Polkadot archive specifically, and Node template archive in the Substrate Archive repository, uh, instead of like defining everything with CLI arguments, I kind of just prefer uh, a, like a Toml configuration. So um, I've kind of have comments here because this is like if you want to implement um, this yourself, you kind of helpful, but so polka.path, path, this is the path to where the actual RocksDB database is stored on disk. Um, cache size is how much cache the RocksDB should keep. Block workers, uh, so blocks are executed in a thread pool. And so you can define how many workers you want. And then you just define the database. Um, and polka dot archive um, supports Weston, Kusama, and polka.db, and those have to be different databases. Um, so that's why there's that. So, yeah. Nice. So your test contract.toml file is basically your configuration file that you pass in just that, the path to that instead of all these values. And then, yeah, it looks like you've defined some really nice uh, parameters there, and it's very educational to review the, the parameters and the configuration options that you have. So that was very interesting. Any other good questions here that, that you think it makes sense to tackle now? Uh, I think we're good. Uh, yeah. Okay. Do you want to, do you have some more of your demo? Um, I, I do want to make sure that we get to all of the, the questions eventually. Um, yeah. Yeah. Uh, I think actually we covered most of what I wanted to cover. Okay. Um, we can go into like the actual code for the actors and stuff, and uh, but I don't know if. Let, let's let's see if we can we can bank through some of these questions. Um, sure. Telmo uh, is asking: Is auxiliary storage also indexed? Auxiliary storage. Um, yeah, I'm not really sure what that means either. Um, so. I don't think so. Do you, is that storage. term evocative to you, auxiliary storage? Do you know what that no, means? No, I mean, I, I, I've seen it in the RocksDB column, but I don't think I specifically index it. If it results as a result of, um, yeah, I, I'm pretty sure we don't index that. So far, we're just okay. indexing the plain um, storage that results from a block's execution, and we're not even indexing actually the child storage that index, uh, results from a block's execution. It's it's kind of produced, but I'm just not inserting into the database yet because the kind of no one's really asked for it. But yeah, yeah, that that makes a lot of sense. Um, let's see. Oh, every software engineer's favorite question: Is there an ETA for type decoding? ETA. Uh, when when so. type decoding? <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, PR is welcome. Uh, <laughs> yeah. I, I don't really like, I don't want to put an ETA. I feel like I've, I've done that before and just let people down. So I'll just say so soon. Can, can we say that it's, it's soon, TM? Yes. Yes. Soon. Soon, great. Um, no, I think that's totally fair. And Mar <laughs> Marco's enjoying our answer. Good, I'm glad. Um, yeah, please follow the PR, um, and I'll I'll look for that when I get a second, and I'll uh, include the link to the PR in the chat. Sure. Uh, but I'm glad to hear that you're excited, Marco. I am too. Um, let's see. What are yeah. some other questions here? Is the let's see. Emmerich has another question, which I'm sure is good. Is the one minus star 
and again, you may have to kind of help me understand what he's asking here. Is the one minus star or one to star block to storage yeah. relationship a storage change relationship, storage change that happens for the block, or a storage state relationship, all available state for the block? It's just uh, one change. So it's not all the state, it's just one change. So it's one to many uh, okay. from blocks. So one block refers to many uh, changes in storage. Gotcha, and, uh, okay. Okay, that, so one block maps to many state changes as little. opposed to one block mapping to one state. Is that kind of the question that he's asking? I think so. I'm, I'm, let me just read this. I think that's what he's asking basically is, is are yeah. you mapping to state changes or are you mapping to the entire state? And it's, you're mapping to state changes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yep. Okay, so it's one to many, yep, cool. Um, let's see. Uh, so we run two nodes on one machine. Okay, yeah, uh, Max, it looks like Joshi kind of helped answer this, right? So it's not two nodes. We're running one blockchain node, which is, you know, running the runtime, but also doing all this other stuff, like lib P2P networking, RPC, consensus, you know, all this other kind of stuff. And then alongside that, we're running archive, which as, Andrew said, connects directly to the database of that node, just one component of that node. And then archive is running the runtime itself and doing all these things that we talked about. So one node, one archive. Um, let's see. Tomas wants to know, is there any custom dictionary for cargo spell check already in parity? Um, I don't think this is really specific to archive in any way. Um, I'm not aware of any uh, special custom dictionaries for, for parity at this time. Potentially not a bad idea, um, but let's take that offline and feel free to ask me that question uh, in element, Tomas. Um, okay, those were all of our questions. Is there any, what else do you have to show us, Andrew? Uh, yeah, so... Not really, really sure here. We can go into. Yeah, I think I, I've I've showed most of what I wanted to show. I can show the yep. actors. Um, so I think that's interesting. Yeah, uh, if you you know if you feel like you're you've said what you had to say, that's cool. Uh, Josh is asking for a node template demo. Show us how to find Alice's balance after block ten. Um, I think you also mentioned that you were going to demonstrate how to maybe answer that question that that person had in Substrate Technical, or was that that query that you showed earlier? Uh, yeah, so I, I kind of took, it took me a while to figure out that query because it was my first time querying into JSON too. Mm -hmm. um, and I think the way type decoding is right now, Alice's account would be just like, sort of in JSON, it would be there, but um, it would be like, I don't know if I can zoom in on this. It would just, it would be decoded raw bytes. So it wouldn't be like substrate formatted or anything, um, which is something that has to be handled in DSUB. Um, uh, yeah, so I, I don't think that's particularly, it's, it's certainly possible with just like a little change to the formatting of how the JSON uh, parses and then it's inserted into the database. Uh, but I synced my node last night not realizing that was the case, so I can't really do it. <laughs> yep. Um, I, I hope I shared the right uh, pitches on DSUB. <laughs> I don't understand that. What is, what is DSUB? Uh, so DSUB uh, is, I can pull it up. DSUB is the library that um, is actually decoding all of this stuff. Uh, oh. So it uses Polkadot.js definitions and sort of parses them um, in order to decode the raw extrinsics. I can actually, I can pull that up in archive. Well, things are going haywire. Okay. Uh, as long as I'm on the right branch.
Yeah. So just to kind of give a little background on type decoding for, for people who may not have had the pleasure of uh, interacting with this particular feature of Substrate before. Uh, Substrate uses a, a type of encoding called scale, which is a non-self-describing encoding. So basically what that means is that everything is reduced down to some series of bytes, and it essentially requires knowledge of that encoding or a dictionary. You can't just decode things on their own. You basically need like a registry or a dictionary on the side that tells you how to decode that. And so a lot of what we're talking around right now is this process of maintaining this registry, decoding the hex into something that's human readable, that kind of stuff. Yep. Um, yeah, exactly. Uh, so here we have the actor for decoding. Uh, and so like the diagram I showed before, if I can pull that up again, this is sitting between, it's sitting like right here. So instead of the metadata sending right to the database, it's sending to a decoder actor and then sending to the database to insert. Um, and so we have D sub included here, I think, D sub decoder, substrate decoder. And all you really have to do is, um, all it really does is just iterate over all of the blocks that we've collected here, iter, uh, maps the blocks, gets the number hash, and calls this function in <clears throat> D sub. Uh, and if we switch to D sub, Uh, it's got all this stuff. And basically what it does is it tracks the sort of cursor in the scale codec. Um, and it has, it, it has definitions defined um, cursor in a scale codec. It, so, so, so scale codec is just a bunch of bytes. So what it does is it takes those bytes um, and we know certain things about the format of the metadata and everything. And from that, if, since we have the metadata, we're able to pull out like what types, like the general format of what types should be where based on um, the polka.js type definitions, uh, which are defined sort of in a different crate uh, here. I, I shared um, in the chat box there a little project that I wrote in TypeScript to help me understand scale codec better because I saw what you were doing there in your code where you're kind of, uh, you have this cursor and it, it, like when you're decoding something in scale, you don't know how long it's going to be when you start decoding it. And so you kind of what you return from these arguments is not just the thing that you decoded but your new position in this byte array that you're decoding and so it, it, it yeah it's it's uh yeah it, it's frustrating to implement these things and a little scary but it it's really kind of fun also and incredibly educational um and so i really encourage other people to literally just rewrite that scale codec library that, that I shared. Because in doing so, I think you'll get so much more empathy and understanding for a lot of these problems that you encounter in, in substrate development. Yeah, for sure. It's, it's certainly complex. It is fun uh, sort of decoding uh, raw bytes and hex and everything. Um, yeah. yeah, it is. So yeah. <laughs> I'm working on on uh, documenting the encoding of extrinsics right now, and man, that's uh, it's one of those things where like it's a rewarding experience that you work for. Like it's not necessarily easy. You're really I, the other thing I wanted to say is I loved how you talked about this actor model and how you said like it made it easy for you to implement this logic, which I think is like such an important thing. You know, when when you're writing code like this, you can think about it as complicated or as simple as you want. You know, there's all different kinds right. of paradigms and concepts that you can set up to help you express these ideas. And 
I don't know much about the actor model. I'm looking forward to learning more about it, but it sounds like you found it really helpful in making this kind of complicated, icky problem something that felt approachable. Um, uh, for so sure, really yeah. Cool. Um, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a big fan of actors. Uh, I, I <laughs> like how you can model the data in a directed graph, sort of like a state machine, um, and just kind of add and remove things as you see fit. Um, yeah. So what, uh, any, any further pitch on dsub there? Yeah, so basically, it, this is all generated from polka.js. So you can see all the different palettes here um, in alphabetical order. Uh, you have like that stations, or a author, probably find system. Um, and basically, all the types that are defined within this palette have to uh, sort of settle down into basic Rust types. So we see there's an option, unsigned 32-bit integer here. Um, there's dispatch outcome. And so the challenge is to parse this and um, get transaction validity error, which might be a struct, into its primitive components. So transaction validity error might be made up of like, I don't know, it's, it's made, probably made up of a string. So that's, it could be a Rust primitive type. And so that we just, we know to decode transaction validity error as a string. Um, and that just goes for everything here. Um, and then paired with the metadata, you know the, like, the types for all the palettes and stuff, um, and you're able to decode stuff. Um, and dsub sort of does this recursively. Uh, it's, kind of, it's, it's kind of hacky, I would say, but it works well. Um, uh, it's still sort of experimental, but you have this notion of two structs where one sort of stateless and just describes. So, so this all this JSON will uh, sort of parse into this Rust type marker, uh, either a type point, type pointer or like a some kind of Rust idiom, um, and then it recursively decodes all of the types, uh, and then it increments the cursor where it needs to in the scale codec byte string, and uh, it. So it uses the polka.js as a dictionary and it will decode stuff. Um, I think the API, yeah. That's all I really have to say about dsub. It's, uh, that's pretty much it. Um, Any, anything that makes it easier to manage scale encoding is amazing. So uh, it, it, I, I also really liked the point that you made that because substrate is implemented in Rust, at the end of the day, everything basically boils down to a Rust type. And yes. so now we have interesting problems, like people may be writing something in JavaScript where they want to have a front end for some substrate chain. And so how do you represent a Rust type in JavaScript? There's not necessarily a straightforward answer to that. You know, there's like different ways that you can approach that problem. Um, and so, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. And actually, I can pull up the metadata here. I think it's still in my GitHub gists. And da David uh, gave you some props there. He said, dsub is really nice. Thank you for building it. So thanks. you you are probably the only person who views it as hacky because you're, you have the most familiarity with it. To all of us, it's just pure magic. Great. I'm happy to hear that. Yeah. I mean, it's still under development, so I hope it gets better. Uh, yeah. But yeah, uh, here we go. So actually the, it's, this is an actual metadata that dsub uses. Um, it's actually backwards compatible. So it supports v11, v10, v8. Uh, and v8 is like the first version that Kusama used, which is the reasoning behind supporting it. Uh, I could, you could probably put more versions into dsub, but then you sort of increase the maintenance cost. Um, uh, yeah, so you can see, let's, let's single out a palette. So now, system. is, is dsub actually using this gist as its oh. back end? <laughs> no, uh, okay. dsub, no, no, uh, dsub will be, where is this? Uh, I think I actually lost it. One thing that I've wondered about before is like, it seems like there may be room to like store a lot of this stuff on like IPFS or something like that is like, 
yeah. some kind of canonical like there's not really any reason for like I mean, in some cases, there may be reason for people to embed the metadata, like if you're on a device without a network or, you know, you need to be super performant or whatever. But in a lot of cases, it would be nice to just kind of have like a canonical decentralized place where people can go yeah. and, and see it. Um, well, the, the, the metadata in Substrate Archive uh, is actually, you can get it through the runtime uh, mm -hmm. for every block. So mm -hmm. uh, that's... The, the raw metadata that is like the encoded bytes. And that's like the same function that the, yeah, if you would call the RPC function, like uh, I think it's just called metadata, mm -hmm. you would get, just get the raw bytes um, and that will decode into a Rust struct for metadata. Um, and so dsub sort of backported all of the versions of metadata from V8 um, in order to be able to decode these older metadata versions. And so index the um, versions uh, the actual decoded extrinsics and stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, so if we see, we have uh, like name account, um, then we have, we have type, and this is storage, I think. Uh, yeah, so if we go to the call types, which I don't know, there's probably a lot here, but here we go, call. <clears throat> uh, let's go with set code. So the arguments for set code. Then if you could make your uh, the text a little larger, oh, please. Sure. That, that looks good, thank you. Yeah. Um, well, why my Firefox is a... Uh... It's, it's Crowdcast. It, it really, it kind of, the streaming messes with your, yeah. your CPU. Okay. I think it's, okay, yeah. So you got the name of the type and then just the type and it's evacuate. So like, you know, we don't really know what that means without further, actually there's probably a better example. Some of the traits like key, we don't really know what that means. It's uh, so that's what the polka.js definitions are for. Uh, we'll see definitions.json. There should be like a key type, key bytes. Let me know bytes. Bytes. Actually, we, we know it's evacuate. Somewhere in here, it's bytes evacuate. And then we know how to decode evac because that's a Rust type. Uh, so yeah. basically what you're saying is that JSON is kind of like a recursive data structure where at one point we've defined that, that the bytes type is a vec U8 and then in other places we can just say, oh, this is a byte. And then if we need to know what a byte is, we go and look it up and we see, oh, okay, that's a vec U8, which is a Rust type. Is that kind of the... Right. Yeah. So yeah, DSub sort of generates a whole lookup table with this and it's able to say, uh, it looks in the metadata and it's, it's finds a type that's named key. And then th these types um, weren't created by me, they were created by the polka.js team and maintained by them. Um, but they basically just written down all the types. So it'll just look up key, see that it's evacuate. And then, yeah, so it, yeah. And Yako has some neat, uh, he's built some neat tooling around this where you basically define a type in TypeScript and then there's some yarn scripts that you run that, that generate everything for you on the back end. Um, so I've made a few contributions to Polka.js and, and Yako has walked me through that process, which again, nice. very educational and informative and fun to do. Yeah, for sure. Um, yeah, so that's sort of that. And then we can see, I can just go into the, it's currently using um, the wrong thing, regex. It's currently using just regex to parse everything. Mm -hmm. So this is parsing the actual JSON and we just have uh, like, what kind of type is it? We, we um, directly defined vec option result compact because those are inbox. Mm -hmm. They're like uh, commonly used sort of types and it will just go through, see if it matches, see if it matches, and then it's able to generate, uh, actually here, see if it matches, uh, sorry, parse it, generate this rest type, rest type marker, which is then passed into like the decode and then we know, we know how to decode. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. Um, yeah, writing stuff like this is really fun. It's like kind of sometimes when you're writing code, you know, like 
there's not necessarily a right answer. Like when you're writing an application, it's like, ooh, I hope the users like this. And like, I designed my UX well, and I designed the features well. And like, you're never really quite sure if you did it right. But when you're doing encoding right. or decoding, it's like a math problem. Like you get it right, right or you don't get it right. And so it's super rewarding because you're like, I solved the computer problem, well, you know, and, and you, you work for that. Right, yeah, for sure, yeah. <laughs> Uh, Looks like Josh, he has a question. Yeah, he's saying it's using regex right now. In your opinion, what's the right tool for parsing in Rust? Um, should I finally dive into learning? <laughs> uh, yeah, I'm not really sure on that. That's why I was, I'm, I'm still sort of ambivalent about using regex because, I mean, you, you could instead of using regex, you could define like, uh, for example, like a peg grammar, and probably it would be much maybe more performant probably i don't know if it'd be more performant but it would definitely be more elegant to look at and more understandable for people to use what's the um, peg grammar uh it's like it's a parsing expression grammar so it's sort of like regex but it's able to just parse everything in o of n time and then generate the rust trucks for that so o of n time would just be like linear time so as long as, as long as it takes to parse that text file it would generate like theoretically generate the rest trucks. So in, in some ways, I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, but at a relatively abstract level, we're talking about like different ways to implement a programming language or, or at least sort a of. parsing yeah. language, yeah. right? Yeah, um, that would be another way. That, 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 that I did like consider doing that, but I think regex is just a lot easier. So yep. it's regex. <laughs> but, but basically like, at the end of the day, the, the problem that we're trying to solve is going through human readable text, basically, yeah. semi-structured human readable text, JSON, and tokenizing that into something that a computer can understand. That is kind of the, pro the, the abstract right. problem we're solving, tokenization. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Awesome. This has been a really, really, really active seminar, Andrew. I think it really speaks to how exciting this all is and how useful it all is. Um, I know that one of the things that you and I talked about is the fact that you have like lots of ideas. Um, if you don't have any more yeah. code to show Andrew, you can probably, yeah. uh, uh, one of the things that you and I talked about is you probably have lots of ideas for things that people can build on top of archives. Um, For sure. Yeah. You want to share any of those those thoughts? Yeah, I mean, um, Marco, I saw Marco in the chat was talking about his project called Substrate Graph, uh, which I really like. Um, it basically takes Substrate Archive, and on top of it, he has a bunch of Docker containers that create um, like an interface for actually querying the archive, not with SQL, but with GraphQL. Which I think is super awesome for like any UI devs that are using React.js or um, like any basically modern JS library using GraphQL is just so much more consistent and easier than like using some SQL library. Um, yeah. Um, in addition to, that, I mean, there's lots of stuff you can build with Subtree Archive. I mean, it's kind of like you could do did. Uh, I was thinking of maybe, you know, you could do a block explorer. I mean, block explorer is like the first really use case that comes when you think indexing, it's like block explorer. So, I mean, there's already focus scan and sub scan, but I think with substrate archive, you could design a block explorer that um, really takes the data and is able to visualize a lot of it in a, in a way that's like super fast and um, works really well together. Um, Marco, do you have any interest in uh, coming on the screen in these last couple minutes and talking a little bit about uh, substrate graph? If you do, just mention in the, the troll box there and I can bring you on. No pressure if you're not set up for that. Um, Joshi also dropped a, a question in there that um, I, I don't think uh, I'm gonna answer because uh, that's not really the kind of thing I'm in the business of answering, uh, but I will go ahead and, and reshare it in the troll box because I think it's a very exciting PR and I, uh, I encourage you all to go look at it. I think you'll see that there's some pretty cool stuff on the horizon. Uh, so that's sure. all I have to say about that. Thank you for sharing that, Joshi. I do think that people are gonna enjoy that. Um, okay, so it, it looks like maybe Marco is not, not set up to come on
screen at this time, which is totally cool. Marco, if you ever want to contact me and, and yep, in the car, well then don't talk to us on Crowdcast, drive safely, dude. <laughs> um, uh, but let's chat sometime in Element and, and maybe we can have you on seminar. That'd be a lot of fun. And uh, yeah, so uh, Andrew, if you don't have anything else to say, uh, I'll, I'm going to kind of open up an, a general request for questions to see if, if anyone has anything. And uh, yeah, while we wait for that, do you have any kind of parting thoughts or anything you'd like to share, Andrew? Uh, not, yeah, not necessarily. I think, yeah, I'm all up for general questions, I think. Nice. Yeah, I, I really, really loved this. I think it's really, uh, I mean, it was much more honestly inspiring than I thought that it was gonna be because I was just excited to learn all about the RDBMS stuff. But, uh, you know, then you came at me with the actor model and connecting directly right, to the, yeah. the DB and everything instead of just using the RPC. So really lots of, uh, lots of stuff to excite you to build on top of Substrate Archive, but then, other ways to build on top of the substrate node itself. So Andrew, I think if, uh, if you don't have anything else to say and if there's not a ton of other questions coming in, uh, you can feel free to drop off. I'll, I'll probably just stick around for another couple of minutes just because I always like to make sure people have enough time to ask questions. Um, but yeah, I think you did a really great job. Thank you so much for, for joining us today. Thanks. Yeah, it was great. Thank you for having me. Uh, yeah. All right. Later, dude. I'll see you around. See ya. How, how do I exit? Yeah, I'll just uh, oh, there you go. <laughs> I was going to kick him off, but he kicked himself off. So yeah, I'll probably just stick around for like another, another minute or two, just in case people have any questions. But other than that, I think this was a really, really fun seminar. And I'm, I'm really looking forward to learning more about uh, Substrate Graph, Marco. And yeah, I hope some other people come on sometime soon and tell me what they're building on top of Archive. Um, definitely check out that PR that Joshi shared. I think that's gonna be pretty exciting for you. Also gonna go ahead and shamelessly plug Subzero, our developer uh, conference that's coming up. Let me just grab the, uh, the link for that. So this is our, our online developer conference. Please, please attend. Someone is streaming this on YouTube and this is weekly. Um, I'm not really sure what the plan is for, for moving this on to YouTube. Um, this link that we're on right now, I'll go ahead and just share it again, just in case. Um, this will turn into a recording after we end the, the meeting. So I don't know if we're gonna be moving things over to YouTube or not. Uh, I'll have to get back to you on that. Ah, we will stream this weekly on YouTube. See, we have, we have lots of friendly people here that staying on Crowdcast. Nice. All right, guys, well, um, I think that's kinda, oh, wait, we got a question. Say if I understand correctly. Substrate Archive is a good choice to replace custom Node.js to query block data into Postgres. So Substrate Archive is a engine, as Andrew put it. I thought that was a really good description. It's an engine that manages the connection between a Substrate node and a Postgres database. So Substrate Archive is what does this business of connecting directly to the, the nodes database and then piping that into a Postgres database. And then what you build on top of that Postgres database that has all of this data that you can index, you know, whether you're building a block explorer or a, a GraphQL uh, API, uh, you know, that's kind of up to you. But I, I I wouldn't say that Substrate Archive would replace a custom Node.js app. It's something that you would build a custom Node.js app front end type of thing on top of. Um, very good question though. I'm, I'm glad that I stayed on to answer that. Um, but because I don't see any other questions coming in, I am gonna drop off now get back to the work. So thanks for coming to seminar. I hope you all enjoyed it. And uh, I don't necessarily know if I'll be hosting next week, but I'll definitely at least tune in and I look forward to seeing y'all then. Bye-bye guys. Enjoy your week.